I'm Mike Royer with an extended interview in this Health Matters Web Extra. Hi everyone and welcome once again to Health Matters. My name is Mike Royer. We're joined on our program today by Dr. John Burkhart, a medical psychologist on staff here at the University Medical Center at the University of Alabama, always one of our favorite guests. It's good to see you again. Thank you for having me back again. We don't want to catch anything. I don't want to catch a cold. I don't want to catch COVID. But as I get a little into my late 60s, I'm starting to think about dementia and I'm thinking I need to keep active. I need to be around these young college students. I'll do, I don't like to do puzzles, but if it'll help keep my mind sharp, sure. I'll do puzzles. I'd love to resist any kind of uh, mind um, weakening, dementia or Alzheimer's, but um, there's only so much we can do, isn't there? Yeah, and I mean, you know, traditionally as we do age, we go through a natural kind of cognitive slowing process. Yeah. And some unfortunately get it at a more severe pace and a more severe case. And that's when you see the different types of dementia, whether it's vascular, sometimes you see that for somebody had a stroke, or most familiar with everybody is Alzheimer's, where you know the most noticeable thing really is usually memory loss is usually the big key there. And we are living longer as a society. Men and women alike are living longer generally. I think there's been a dip or two here and there, but so a disease that comes with aging is going to be more uh, prevalent, more noticeable, and more people are gonna know about it. Uh, absolutely, and, it, and especially because usually it happens in combination with other things where it's congestive heart failure, um, maybe even sometimes pneumonia, something simple like that, uh, COPD, all types of diabetes, things like that, but it's not necessarily, a, you know, you're gonna die from that once you get diagnosed with it on its own. It's just, as you age, lots of other things happen to your body, and it happens to be one of the more prevalent things, right? Dr. Burkhardt, give us your thoughts about medications. Several have come out. I've read an article recently about one that's very, very expensive and some critical of it, not thinking it does much good. Where are you on your optimism of, we're coming into some areas where some meds are going to help people down the road? Sure, well, so a few places. I guess overall, I'm always helpful somebody's gonna find something that's gonna help. And what we know about medication or even diagnosing to begin with, if you're concerned, right, the reason you want to go and see your doctor as soon as you can is because if you have a dementia type process, your cognitive decline is kind of on the slope. And the less you do anything about it, depending, the steeper the slope gets and you fall farther down. But if you think about, here's the slope, but if you have medication, and some other interventions, well now it's not as gradual, right? So having the medication can definitely help with that. And a lot of times people also have some depression and anxiety, especially if they've never had it before. And so the medications, that, you know, a pretty big generic term for it would be like a cognitive enhancer. I think most people would probably recognize something like Aricept has been around for a while, but those are meant to help slow down or pump the brakes if you're going down a hill. Right, but they also have some other uses because there are some personality changes that, you know, that do come up with that. I get my annual physical and they check everything and take some blood and run tests and all kinds of things. I don't recall, even in recent years, my doctor going, let's do some cognitive testing too to see where you are and if you're remembering things. Should we be looking at that as we get a little older of seeing if we could notice change? Yes, I mean, absolutely. And sometimes it may depend on the, your physician, I mean, I know with us, you know, we have Dr. Ann Holly and she's our geriatrician. So one of the things when she sees people, she actually has a cognitive screener. Now, um, I can't speak for, I don't know if she's it for every single person she's there, but I imagine pretty much so. So, you know, you can do things like that. And also if you look at how we kind of treat people and how it changes, what's very common now is everybody kind of gets a depression screener a lot of the times just mm -hmm. to see how they are, especially in like family medicine or primary care. And you know, you bring up a good point, being able to notice any change would be great because a lot of times what happens is by the time I see them and they say, well, it doesn't have a history of this and what's going on. So if we do any type of neuropsychological testing, that's really the first baseline. So we have no idea maybe what that person looked like three, six months, even a year ago, right? So from this point moving forward, this is what we know in addition to the type of education they've had, the type of work that they've done and, and those types of things. A friend of mine who lived into his mid and slightly past mid-90s 
uh, for years said, if you ask him something and he couldn't remember it, he'd say, wait a second, I just have to wait for it to go around. I think he was referring to a merry-go-round in his head and it would come around, but it would come around. And I find once in a while, I can't think of something. If I just give it a second, it'll come around. Is that anything to be concerned about? So it, it's not, but one thing I do notice clinically as the older we get, especially if I haven't, especially when meeting somebody for the first time and I'm asking about their life, yeah. When we're younger, people just tend to give more straight to the point answers. Yeah. But if I ask somebody that's a little bit older, what'd you do for a living? They may say something like, well, you know, I was like 22 and I was walking down the street and I looked at this job and the post office was hiring. And so I wasn't really sure. And I talked to my, instead of just saying- I was a post I, I, Yeah, I worked the for the post office for 30 Interesting. years. Interesting. And you know, I had to walk my route and everything. So the storytelling, right, becomes a way of you recalling information. And if you think about our society anyway, it's all built on storytelling, right? And our elders are always the one that tells stories, but for some reason, as we age, that process happens more. So the fancy term would be like circumferential, right? You circumvent till you come back to the answer. Yeah. Interesting. Well, you just made this very personal to me because <laughs> as I get older, I tell more details about stories and re seem to be able to recall details more than I used to. I think I'm trying harder. I wonder if that's well, what we do. Well, not necessarily. I mean, if you really think about it, so one of the things that always comes up when you have to talk to somebody, whether their their loved one ha has the condition, you know, they'll ask them something. Oh, what did we do when we were 21? And the person, boom, fires it right off, right? Yeah. Okay, the person's 75. They've been telling that story for 54 years. And if you ask them what they did three days ago for breakfast, I've practiced that story three times. Yeah. So which are you better at, the one over that time? And you know, you can also start to tell a lot about somebody, especially um, their memory, because most people just think, well, if they can't remember things, it's all shot. But we have like long-term memory and secondary long-term memory. So secondary long-term memory is your last 10 years, and your long-term memory is how everybody thinks about it. So by talking to the person and asking them questions, you can get a better idea of their deficits and what they can encode and what they can recall. I want to ask you to deal now with the person that doesn't have Alzheimer's, the spouse, the loved one, the caregiver, that it's hard on them and, and it can affect their health too, caring for someone that is well down the road of an Alzheimer's challenge. What would you, guidance would you give to those people about, you know, they love their other person and yeah. they wanna take care of them as long as they can. Absolutely. But that can be a risky thing for their own health. It is because it can be very challenging depending on the severity of the illness. But even if you just take a very mild kind of case of it where the person is, they're always hoping to kind of ask these questions that the, that the person with the dementia has and they answer it. And if they answer it, I feel good because that means they can still remember, right? But if they don't answer it, people keep asking, say, how come you don't, how come you don't? And then the person gets frustrated and I tell them, don't give that person the opportunity. If it's Tuesday, September 28th, and it's three o'clock, walk in the room and tell that person that because sometimes they don't know. So instead of being worried that it's 1982, tell them where they are because that kind of helps bring them more into the present, right? And then the other big part too is you gotta take appropriate breaks because 24 seven caregiving, when you think about a hospital, it has shifts, yes. right? 12 hour shifts, usually the most, maybe lately because of COVID, they're a little bit longer, but traditionally eight and 12. Yeah. So you have to find some time to, for yourself to recharge yourself so that you're able to care And I, that's another one that's pretty big because they always feel like they're abandoning their person. But the problem is, is that they've run themselves so low that they, they can't help the person like they normally have, right? And it just makes it more difficult. And there are resources out there that people can explore if they need help, maybe not quite hospice yet, but care of some kind, there are programs uh, that uh, hospitals and medical groups can guide them to. There is, and I probably, unfortunately, one of the effects of, of the pandemic is the fact that there used to be senior daycares and things like that where people could go and, I mean, we're not doing that, at least not that I'm aware of, that maybe they're starting to do it a little bit, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure everybody be a little hesitant, which is unfortunate because it kind of gives everybody, I mean, you know, the individual gets to go and it has some different type of stimulation, kind of like what you were saying with puzzles and all that, yeah. and talking to other people, while um, 
the caregiver gets a chance to just go and take a break and know that that person is safe and it's okay and you know maybe I get a chance to do something for myself. Dr. John Burkhardt, we appreciate you and your interesting, you're, you're always uh, full of good information for us and we appreciate it very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me.